There we go. So this should work. Dun, dun, dun. So hello and welcome to the second class of the 2019 O'Hara Training Academy presented by Gals Guide. I am Dr. Leah Leach. I am the headmistress of the O'Hara Training Academy uh, and the founder of Gals Guide. Uh, so a, a few little housekeeping notes as it's our second class, although I believe all of our participants have been here for the first time. So that's our we're here last time. Uh, but I am recording these with hopefully just my screen this time. Last time it was it. We'll find out what that button is. Um, so we're going to hold all the questions till the end. You can write them in the chat. I'm going to do my best to pay attention to that. Uh, as sometimes I just like get in the zone and I get super excited. And then like this one, I actually kind of get a little bit angry. You're going to see me a little bit angry. It'll be fun. Um, but we will open it up at the end for uh, questions for everybody. So it should be tons of fun. So let's get into these glorious women. The Mercury 13. Okay, so the Mercury 13 are the 13 women who took the same astronaut testing as the Mercury 7, but they were not allowed to enter the NASA space program, either hard stop period or patriarchy. One of those two. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about why, um, and we're also gonna get to know these gals as well and why they wanted to be astronauts because that's the really interesting part for me of the story. So I will stress that the Mercury 7 was a term that was given to the seven NASA astronauts. They were approved by NASA, where the term Mercury 13 is more of a nickname. They were not officially in the Mercury program. They were not recognized by NASA. Uh, they were not in any NASA program. They were tested by the same doctor as the Mercury 7. They went to the same facility. They took the same tests under the same conditions, but the men's tests were paid for by NASA and the women's tests were privately funded. Don't worry, we'll get into the who, where's, and why's. <laughs> So these gals were called the Lovelace Women in Space Program. And that just doesn't have the same ring to it as the Mercury 13. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like plain and simple. So I'm going to call them the Mercury 13 as a group. There is a documentary on Netflix that is called the Mercury 13 that I highly recommend. I sent out an email with the trailer. I also put it in the Facebook Evite and I think Yes, and I also put it on the Twitter of the documentary trailer. Here is what the book looks like. This is our autographed copy. Uh, our other copy is actually checked out right now. Uh, but this is the book by Martha Ackerman, which I also highly recommend, both of them, wonderfully to digest. Um, so I like to tell as much as a linear story as possible. So I got to back up a little bit into the space program and lay some groundwork on the early days of the space program. If you're totally into space, awesome, this is a refresher. I like refreshers. Also, if you are new to it, this lays that groundwork to um, why the space program uh, was invented, how important it was, and how these women got there. So has, um, I would normally do a show of hands, but I mean, it's a Zoom call. So if you have heard of WASP, the Women Air Force Service Pilots, uh, they were very early on, they were women in flight training, and they were able to serve the country during World War II. So that is the women in WASP. Their program flew military planes, but they did not go to war. They would get planes from the manufacturer, and they would test them, uh, and then they would fly those planes to the military base that it needed to be at. They were a taxi, they were a ferry service, but they were in danger every single time that they flew because they were flying in war zones. So it wasn't like a cushy job at all. So WASP started with this really terrible acronym of WAFS, W-A-F-S, <laughs> yay, Women's Auxiliary Ferrying Squadron in 1942. So Nancy Harkness Love, she worked with the U.S. Tra Air Transport Command out of Delaware. That's the WAFs. Uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Jacqueline Cochran came in. 
Jacqueline Cochran's name is going to pop up a lot, and my face is going to show a little bit of shade every time I mention her, and you'll find out why. Uh, she established another group out of Texas. Uh, it was called the WFTD, which was the Women's Flying Training Detachment. Uh, on top of ferrying, they would also do practice missions, and they would also provide instruction for the male pilot cadets. That was the difference between Jacqueline's and Nancy's uh, women's flight program. So these two groups eventually merged and became WASP. WASP is sometimes what you hear in World War II documentaries. That became Jacqueline Cochran, there's her name again, as the director of WASP. So... She'll keep coming back, don't worry. When the war ended, WASP disbanded, and once again, the women were banned from flying military planes in the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, as long as women had a pilot's license, they could fly um, private aircraft, but certain planes would now be completely out of their reach. Jet planes would be completely out of their reach. The love of flying, though, never left these gals. So Jean Nora Jensen loved flying. Uh, she was a religious person, and she even asked God uh, why she was cursed with loving something so much that had large gatekeepers. Uh, Sarah Ratley uh, said that flying gave her the thrill of being free. She continued, like, saying, having a new perspective up there. I thought it was poetically beautiful. Uh, Rita Woltman, she grew up in Minnesota. And when she first saw a plane, uh, one day she knew that she would be in one of those two. People in her town did not think that flying was for women, but she knew better and she did it. She went flying. Uh, for Jacqueline Cochran, <laughs> she had more access to flying than most women in America. Uh, Jacqueline Cochran made a lot of money in the cosmetic industry. And then she married a millionaire who had lots of connections to aircrafts, including a jet planes. So she was the first woman to break the sound barrier in an F-86, and she set lots of speed records. Geez, when you're the only one that has access to these particular planes and these particular, you know, records, of course you're the first ones doing it. But Jacqueline was a no-nonsense gal. Uh, she's very complicated, and so by that I mean she lied to make herself look good many, many times. <laughs> she will always uh, try to be number one in everything. She's highly competitive. So unlike Jacqueline, Many of the gals who loved flying uh, would daily would want to daily fly for the military, and they wanted their freedom back again, is what they said. So many of them started racing in the Power Puff Derby. It's basically like a drag race in the air. Um, and these gals just loved these races. So competing in the Derby was their chance to prove that they were the girls who knew what they were doing. They also formed lifelong friendship because of these derby races. So the start of the space race was 1957 with the launch of Sputnik. Russia was way ahead of everything that America was doing for space exploration. Sputnik made it very painful to Americans that we were so far behind. So a year later, the Project Mercury was formed and its goal was to get a human to space. This meant they needed humans, right? Well, the group in charge of Project Mercury was the U.S. Air Force and the very newly created NASA. Now, even though I say new, um, when I talk about hidden figures in a later class, we'll talk about how NASA before this was called NACA, N-A-C-A. Um, and they were working on airplanes and military planes that then translated into NASA for space. So I'll go into more detail of the difference between the two of them. But the two agencies put their heads together and they came up with a criteria to be an astronaut. So this is very important as it'll relate to why uh, girls didn't qualify. So the qualifications to be an astronaut were number one, a graduate of the Navy or Air Force test pilot school. Number two, 15 hours of flight time. Three, 
qualified in jet aircrafts, four, an engineering background, and number five, you had to be five feet 11 or less. <laughs> So let's break these down real quick because there's some hidden gems in these if you are a lady. <laughs> so number one, um, graduate of the Navy or Air Force test pilot school. Women couldn't be selected for those schools until 1976. So we're talking 58 when they're looking for people. So women could not even attend these test pilot schools. Uh, number two, the 15 hours of flight time. Totally possible if you were a WASP and totally possible if you flew uh, private planes. So that's totally possible, yay. Uh, number three, um, qualified in jet aircrafts. Well, jet aircrafts were only allowed to military personnel and apparently Jacqueline Cochran. <laughs> Those are the only two people that were allowed to fly jets, Jacqueline and then military people. And because women can be military, yeah, see, there it is. Uh, so then number four, uh, an engineering background. So the engineering background at this time was available to high-level universities in white and black colleges. However, um, as we'll talk about later in Hidden Figures, Mary Jackson at this time had to sign a petition to ask the state just to go to an engineering program because of the color of her skin and the state that she was in. So it was available, but it wasn't, it was still a hurdle. Let me put it that way. Getting women into engineering schools was still very much a hurdle at this time, but not impossible. And number five, five feet 11 or less tall. Not commonly a problem for women, not commonly. You know, there's just some tall ladies out there. <laughs> so, there you go. There's the breakdown. So seeing how this uh, rule, we're able to say no women without saying the words no women uh, was really quite interesting. So 32 male candidates were selected and they were reported to, I'm oh, sorry, 32 male candidates reported to the Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So 32 were selected to see if they could pass the training. Dr. Randy Lovelace set the standard for astronauts in the Mercury program. Lovelace was the very, uh, was a first, the first surgeon who was head of space medicine for NASA. NASA is new, so but he is the first. Uh, Lovelace also wanted to test female candidates. And when he voiced this to our first lady of the skies, she gave herself that nickname, Jacqueline Cochran. There she is again. Uh, Jacqueline was all ears. Ooh, ladies in the space program. So Jackie had set so many records, but there's one she really, really wanted. She wanted to be the first woman in space. That's what she wanted. So she and her husband, Floyd Odom, funded Lovelace to do the same astronaut training tests on women. Cool. <laughs> so 25 women were invited for all three phases of testing. All right. So phase one. So phase one, the first phase of testing took place in 1960 at the Lovelace Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico, same as the men. It was five days of testing and it was done either alone or in pairs. Um, it seems to be that there was a lot of uh, general reporting that the staff at the Lovelace uh, Clinic was not really sure how women's bodies worked. <laughs> And they really weren't sure how they would respond to these 75 to 87 tests. I found some reports saying that there was like 75 tests, and then I found some that were 87. I found some that like kind of scattered in between. But there was at least 75 different tests that they had these women go through, and they, they didn't know how their bodies would react. Uh, but we're talking dental. We're talking x-rays. We're talking enemas every morning. We're talking swallowing three feet of rubber hose for a stomach test, 19 different needles in your head to get brain waves, drinking a pint of radioactive water, uh, 10 degree water in your ear for a caloric reflex test that would cause this involuntary eye and head movement. It was to see if the brain stem was healthy, but they would put them through this. Um, so, of this testing, of the 30, 25, sorry, 25 women who went in, 13 of them passed. That's how we get our Mercury 13. Jacqueline Cochran was not one of them. 
she did not pass the test. <laughs> she paid for all these. <laughs> she wanted to be the first woman in space. Uh, but yeah, she didn't pass the test. Um, do you think maybe she was happy about it? Let's wait and see. <laughs> So before the next phase of testing, the world witnessed the first man in space, and it was Yuri Gagarin. So a month later, the United States sent Alan Shepard on a suborbital flight, and it was like 15 minutes of up and down. It was no flying, but it's a lot more than I've ever done in space. And then we started phase two of testing for the Mercury 13. So phase two of the testing was in Oklahoma City, and this was the psychological portion of the testing. One of these tests was water isolation. So these uh, gals were asked to float in a tank of warm water for as long as they could. That, that was the test, was how long could they endure this. It was a sensory deprivation chamber. So it was dark. The lights were very, very low. They had earplugs in. They had a little waistband that kind of gave them floating. You know what I mean? L little floaties. Um, but this was to mimic weight, uh, weightless conditions in space. All right. So the women were perfectly happy to be in there forever. If you watch the documentary, it's almost like they miss this deformation tank. <laughs> they loved the psychological testing of this. Um, it was their second favorite thing to flying. Let me put it that way. <laughs> they loved it. Uh, it was peaceful. It was quiet. There was solitude. Nobody was bothering you. But the men who took the same test couldn't stand it. They started crawling out of their skin. Some of them actually mentally cracked during this, but the women nailed it. Uh, Jerry Cobb was documented at setting the record. She stayed in for nine hours and 40 minutes. Later, Wally Funk said in an article that she personally stayed in for 10 hours. So the average for the men, three. <laughs> three hours before they started to hallucinate. That's how long the guys could stay in there. Yeah, interesting. So Dr. Lovelace was thrilled with these results during phase two, and he took the women's test to Washington. He showed the brass how much better the women were doing than the men with the very same test, and he was very excited about this. So the final phase uh, third phase, was set for September of 1961. It was supposed to take place in Pensacola, Florida with the Navy. The gals were then supposed to have their jet orientation tests and also do their centrifuge uh, testing as well. They all had their plane tickets. They were packed up. They were ready to go when NASA suddenly canceled phase three of testing at their facility with the Navy. The rumor was the Navy, not the Navy, that NASA, the rumor was that NASA got word that the women being tested were better than the men and they didn't like it. So they were going to pull the entire experiment before it got out to anyone. The girls were absolutely heartbroken that the project was scrapped, uh, that they couldn't finish that last bit of testing. They were told to keep building their flight experience and perhaps the program would come back, but for now their dreams of being an astronaut would have to wait. So Wally Funk, uh, who was the ranked third in testing, so she was number three overall, she would use this time to teach herself um, airplane aerobatics and she also became a flood instructor during this time. Uh, Jerry Cobb was already a very accomplished pilot. She started flying when she was 12. Um, at age 19, she was teaching men how to fly. Um, she was a test pilot for aero design and she worked for an engineering company and she set a lot of records in her aircraft. When she was interviewed for women being tested for space flight, she said, why do you feel there is a need for a woman in space? And she said, quote, well, it's the same thing. Is there a need for men in space? I mean, if we're going to send a human being into space, we should send the most qualified. And in certain areas, women have a lot to offer. And in other areas, men do. I think we ought to use both. That was Jerry's thinking. 
Uh, she was ranked, Jerry was ranked uh, the top in Mercury 13. She ranked the top 2% of all genders who were tested for the Mercury program. So she was right up there. In other words, she was above a lot of the guys. <laughs> um, after John Glenn's launch into orbit in 1962, Jerry wanted to fight for a chance to be an astronaut, and she joined forces with Janie Hart. So Janie Hart was one of the Mercury 13. She also passed every single test and that she was allowed to take, obviously. Janie was the wife of a senator, and she was also the mother of eight children. So Jamie earned her pilot's license in World War II. She was a member of the Red Cross Corps. She was also the first of female helicopter pilot license in Michigan. And she was a member of the Flying Farmers of Michigan. Didn't know that was a thing. Loved the idea of Flying Farmers of Michigan. Uh, Jerry and Jannie took their case to Congress. They were asked to testify before a congressional hearing. Uh, it was a special subcommittee of the selection of astronauts, and it took place July 17th, 1962. This means there's amazing amount of documentation about what was said <laughs> at this wonderful uh, hearing. Uh, Jerry Cobb was the first to make an opening statement. Uh, she was asked to be the spokesperson for the gals, for the Mercury 13. So she spoke for them. And this is a brief uh, opening statement of what she said. She said, let us all among ourselves recognize that we women pilots who want to be part of research and participation in the space exploration are not trying to join a battle of the sexes. As pilots, we fly and share mutual respect with male pilots in our profession. We seek only a place in our nation's space future without discrimination. We ask as citizens of this nation to be allowed to participate with seriousness and sincerity in the making of history now, as women have in the past. There were women on the Mayflower and in the first wagon trains west working alongside men to forge new trails and new vistas. We ask that opportunity in the pioneering of space. It's a beautiful point. She also talks about the medical and scientific reasons for using women as astronauts. Um, she highlights, quote, women weigh less, so they consume less food, less oxygen than men. It's very important when every pound of humanity and the necessary life support systems is a grave obstacle in the cost and capability factors of main, manned sp space vehicles. There's words. Uh, women are more radiation resistant and less prone to heart attacks because of the way the good Lord constructed them, she says. Uh, she goes on to say, scientists say that women are less susceptible to metonymy, loneliness, heat, cold, pain, noise than the opposite sex. A vital fact to keep in mind is our nation's plans for space exploration of increasingly longer duration. They're kind of talking about that, you know, deprivation tank where it's like, we can last in there longer. <laughs> And space flight's gonna take a long time. Uh, for her third and final point, she brought up how the country was intensely proud of the Mercury 7. She asked for the same opportunity for the women. She said, to bring glory to our nation by American women becoming the first in space in the world to make a space flight. No nation has sent a human female into space. We offer you 13 women pilot volunteers. She's like going, hey, you want to be the first? Because Russia has been the first in so many other parts of the space exploration. How about the first woman in space? We're offering you qualified volunteers. The chairman of the special subcommittee, Victor Enfuso, responded by thanking Ms. Cobb for her excellent statement. That's what he said. Uh, and then he said, I think that we can safely say at this time that the whole purpose of space exploration is to someday colonize these other planets. And I don't see how we can do that without women. Yeah, so the room totally laughed at that point because, you know, hmm. I mean, I'll let you digest what that statement kind of means for women's role in the space program and what they thought women were going to be used for in space. Quickly, they called on Janie Hart before the room kind of realized what they were doing. Um, and the press committee was very obsessed with her having eight children. That was like primarily their questions. Um, I mean, it's even in the way that they introduced her. Um, and Janie actually really calls him on it too. So um, 
she said, I would like to say, I can't help but notice you call upon me immediately after you refer to colonizing space. <laughs> and Mr. Antuzo says, oh, well, that's why I did it. And then the room laughs again. So it's really drawing that connection again of, oh, well, we're going to be able, need to be able to make babies in space. Let's now call upon the woman who has eight children. Wow. Uh, so perhaps Janie got a little bit more informal and jokey introduction because her husband is a senator, but Janie really did fire back. Her opening statement uh, had this section. It said, it is inconceivable to me that the world of outer space should be restrict, res, ugh, restricted to men only, like it's some sort of stag club. I'm not arguing that women be invented to, in, admitted to space merely so they won't feel discriminated against. I'm arguing that they be admitted because they have a very real contribution to make. And she goes on to talk about a hundred years ago, it was inconceivable that women would be nurses. Uh, but when there was a shortage of men in the job because of war, women were welcome to be nurses and excelled at the job. Uh, she says, quote, it seems a basic error in America thought that only time women were allowed to make a full contribution to better the nature is when there is a manpower shortage. She goes on to talk about women's political uh, potential, potential of talents and capabilities, and how young female students who are in science and engineering studies, they write her letters and they talk about their frustrations and their harsh discrimination that they are feeling as they are trying to educate themselves. Uh, Janie said, quote, if girls elect to be homemakers, excellent, provided the choice is not dictated by the discrimination of all other careers. So basically, not just lack of options. Um, Janie asked that the tests be finished and that new research will to be done. She says, quote, to encourage more talented women to enter specialized fields relating to space engineering. The follow-up questions for Janie were asking her if flying activity encourages other people, both men and women, to take up flying. And her answer was yes. And then they asked her if her flying and her being in the program would encourage other women to take up space flight. And she said yes. And I think this scared some men who were already fighting for a very tight selection of spots. And the idea of encouraging more women who were already, a handful of them were already doing better than them in testing the competition would get really difficult for those very few spots in the program. So there's that added. But then the chairman ends his question to Janie and said, would you go as far, Mrs. Hart, to say that anything a man can do, a woman can do better? And she didn't take the bait. She said, no, sir, I would not. So both gals were very clear in interviews and their testimony that they were not there to mail bash or to say that they were better than men. That was very deliberate on their part and that was very intentional. They were not there to say that they were better. They were saying that they deserved inclusion and a chance to be in a level playing field. All they wanted was a level playing field. But the press reported their hearing as begging Congress that was a headline. Uh, the gals were not begging. Uh, the press also kept asking Janie uh, if she went to space, who would take care of her kids? Like, that was the main question they kept asking her. It was very weird. Uh, it was 1962. Um, and honestly, it still seems like, you know, congressional hearings and people on the bench really don't listen to the testimony that's in front of them. They have their own agendas. Um, but eventually they got down to the nitty gritty of the problem. Women were not allowed to be jet pilots. And jet pilots was um, a criteria for the astronaut program. The schools were solely operated by the military and those schools were off limits to women. So the follow-up question was asked about the safety records of these women jet pilots. Well, once again, uh, they had to explain that women can't fly jets in America. So beyond Jacqueline Cochran, there's no data on women's safety in jet flight. The data just doesn't exist. Um, and when that question was asked about women flying jets, 
guess who walked into the room? Miss Jacqueline Cochran. Oh, so, you know, God's female gift to flying, Jacqueline Cochran. Uh, she was called into this committee hearing because she funded the Lovelace Women Space, uh, Women in Space program. See, it's too long. It's Mercury 13. Uh, she took the test herself, right? So Jerry and uh, Janie were really excited and they thought Jackie's gonna come in. She's gonna save the day. People listen to her, that she's gonna use her celebrity. She's gonna use her experience and she's really going to cement the importance of the case. And guess what she did? She threw them all under the bus. Absolutely threw them under the bus. Remember, Jackie didn't pass the test. Uh, she was not one of the Mercury 13. She was the president of WASP, and she worked with the Air Force. Uh, and an interesting little tidbit, she was trying to get a job at NASA. So she said there was no discrimination against women in the astronaut program. She said that spaceflight was expensive, and she said that women would basically slow it down. Uh, they would make it cost more. And they would complicate the schedule that was already in place. So she offered the idea that women should be tested for research as crew members and not astronauts uh, because they can't be active in military duty. She seemed to really be campaigning for the idea of women as crew members uh, so she would be able to train them and have them ready. Uh, but she also said she would have to have a large pool of women for the program because she would lose so many women candidates to marriage and childbirth. And this would cost the government a lot of money. So she was really great and really helpful. And now you see why my face does what my face does every time I mention Jacqueline Cochran. <laughs> uh, so the next day, uh, was the boys turn, the Mercury 7, to testify to Congress. John Glenn and Scott Carpenter arrived. Uh, they were also there with NASA Director George Lowe. Now, I know the world loves John Glenn. I know they do. And I know he's like the Tom Hanks of his day. <laughs> But let me paint a picture of what these guys were doing in 1962. They were risking their lives to test something that had never been done. Um, part of it is being willing to strap yourself to a rocket with just a couple of chemical equations away from being a bomb. Um, it's a big ego. And in this case, it's a lot of machismo to prove you are not scared, to prove you are manly. Now, John Glenn said in his testimony, Quote, it's just a fact. The men go off and fight the wars and fly the airplanes and come back and help design and build and test them. The fact that women are not in this field is the fact of our social order. That's what John Glenn said. Uh, when asked by an interviewer, uh, the interviewer asked, but if you could find women better qualified than yourself, how would you welcome them into the program? John Glenn just left. <laughs> women more qualified than him. Uh, he says, oh, they would be very welcome. And he's saying it like under biting teeth and the room's just laughing. Like there would be nobody better qualified than him. Uh, when astronaut Gordon Cooper asked if there was any room in our USA program for a woman astronaut, um, this is what he said. And he has, he has a farmer's accent. And there's no way to like say the words that he says without me saying this and like it's gonna seem like a really ridiculous accent so I just apologize he is from Oklahoma all right and he says well we could have used a woman on the second orbital Mercury Atlantis we had we could have put a woman the same type of woman and flown her around instead of the chimpanzee he was dead serious when he says this but the room just burst into laughter, talking about using a woman instead of the chimpanzee. It was very clear that the idea of women being in the space program was really a joke to a lot of people. Uh, one person it was absolutely not a joke to was the president at the United States at that time, Lyndon B. Johnson. He sent a letter to James Webb, the head of NASA, with a handwritten note at the bottom 
that said, let's stop this now. And it was stopped. So there was no more talk of women in the NASA Mercury program. A few months later, after all of this transpired, Valentina Tershikova of the USSR became the very first woman in space. She orbited the Earth 48 times. Again, more than I've done. <laughs> so a very fun fact is the hearing brought up the chimpanzee thing, okay? The, uh, there, there was a chimp college in New Mexico where the United States was training 50 chimpanzees for space flight, and one of them was female. So female chimpanzees could qualify, but not female humans. Uh, it was very unclear of who was funding this program. So interesting. Uh, Jamie, after this whole congressional thing, was pretty much radicalized that day. Uh, she would later, later go on to be a founding member of NOW, the National Organization of Women. Uh, we waited until 1976 uh, to have the inclusion of women in flight training schools. Eileen Collins was the very first woman in the program. She became the first woman pilot for a space shuttle mission in 1995. When she announced uh, that she was going to be on a space shuttle mission, she thanked publicly the Mercury 13. They were her role models and she invited all of them to her launch. Um, ironically, or maybe not so ironically, there were seven of them that arrived. So the Mercury 13, seven showed up. Mercury seven, the Mercury seven of the guys, but they're ladies. <laughs> so before getting on the shuttle to command it, Eileen said into the microphone, quote, I would like to recognize the Mercury 13 and ask them to stand if it was not for the Mercury 13, I would not be here today. So the seven surviving Mercury 13 gals felt redeemed and deeply, deeply moved by the launch. Um, today, uh, of the ladies who are still with us, there are five that are still with us. Myrtle Cage is 95, Wally Funk is 81, Sarah Gorlick is 89, Rita Woltman is 93, and Jean Stromber is 83 years old. So these ladies are still here with us and they are amazing. Um, so as I'm about to open this up for questions and comments and, you know, venting, I'm going to pose this thought challenge to you, okay? I want you to take just a moment to imagine in 1969, just put yourself there, whether you were alive, saw it, witnessing it, re-witnessing it, seeing it on television years and years later, that moon landing in 1969, imagine if just one of those first astronauts who stepped foot on the moon was female. Just what would that feel like? How would that have shifted our culture to see men and women as equals in a feat so vast as reaching and standing on the moon? Yeah. So that is the question um, that I will now open it up for questions and stuff. <laughs> 